good afternoon. My name is Aaron Schauer, and I'm the instructor of Arboriculture and Urban Forestry at Gateway Technical College, which is a small two-year college and a small two-year program that I offer in Kenosha, Wisconsin, located just north of the border of Illinois and just north of Chicago. I'd like to thank the Illinois Arbor Association for this opportunity to come present to you today. And today I'd like to speak to you about the changing face of arboriculture. So one of the interesting things that I've found is that the culture of different locations as it relates to trees seems to vary, but always there seems to be some relative culture in relation to trees. In Wisconsin, for example, uh, trees are often cut down and removed when they've been planted around buildings and they no longer fit or they're a poor choice, but oftentimes they're also removed for firewood. So we often think of trees as some that we utilize for firewood, for paper, and for industry. Uh, we think of trees as something that gives people oxygen, of course. This was an interesting, different view that I had when I went down to Mexico City to help out the Mexican Arborist Association and, and Eduardo Medina with the second annual climbing competition that they held. So I went down there to assist as judging, and it was a fantastic opportunity and fantastic trip. Now, what was amazing to me is the, co the competition was held at a large park in the center of Mexico City. And in this park, they had these massive cypress trees. And these were Montezuma cypress, kind of a version of bald cypress that they grow down there. And you can see right here, this image of this one that was dead, and unfortunately it died back in the late 40s, early 50s, I believe. But because the tree was so important to them, they actually left it as a statue. The stump remains still today, even though the tree has moved on and died. Now, these trees were very important to them because they were planted by the Aztecs. Believe it or not, these trees are reported to be about 500 years old. This one especially would have been. And you can just tell based on the size how old it must have been. And so in this area, these trees were an important part of their culture. Now, as we've gone through history, trees, as we'll look at here shortly, have been an important part of culture as well. So today I'd like to look at you, or like to speak with you first about the difference between agriculture and urban forestry, and then to go through the history of tree care and the methods that we use. And then also look at, are there some lessons we could possibly gain for the future? So why should we care about history, first of all? And many industries look at their history and some seem to pay more attention to it than others. But these are some thoughts of the past that others have given about why to pay attention to history. Theodore Roosevelt said, the more you know about the past, the better prepared you are for the future. Dr. Martin Luther King said, we are not only the makers of history, we are made by history. I would suggest in our culture that's true as well. And Michael Crichton, the famous author who wrote Jurassic Park and Congo and a few others that became Hollywood movies, said, if you don't know history, then you don't know anything. You are a leaf that doesn't know it's part of a tree. So first of all, let's think of what we're talking about. Here we're talking about the changing face of arboriculture. But often I've found that there is confusion between what is really arboriculture and what is urban forestry, especially among students. So arboriculture is more of what we see here on the left, right? So here's a picture of me pruning a eucalyptus tree. Uh, down below here is an image that I shot of treating a green ash up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Over here on the right, we have some images that more relate to urban forestry. We have a street tree inventory where all these little green dots represent trees within this city. And down here in the bottom, we have somebody taking diameter, which would be used during a street tree 
inventory, generally speaking. So really the differences are that arboriculture is about the care and maintenance of trees, not just about the forest, but about specific trees, really. Urban forestry is the management of forests in the urban environment. So we're managing for the forests, but forests that exist in an urban environment versus traditional forestry. But like traditional ur forestry, urban forestry focuses on the entire population, whereas arboriculture focuses on individuals. And so when we focus on the individuals, our maintenance looks at pruning, removals, removing ones that don't belong, plant health care related to these specific individuals, not forest health care, but plant health care of an individual again, which may utilize integrated pest management, which may include some consulting, and it may include trying to preserve old trees that have not been cared for well over time through the process of structural support systems. Whereas in urban forestry, we're managing the population. So the first thing you need to know is what you have or an inventory. From there, you may create condition classes, DBH classes to know your diameters, to know what size tree of a tree population you have. Do you have an older, younger population? And if it's old, do we anticipate that we're going to be removing a lot of species and therefore we need to start creating a younger population as well? And then to prescribe maintenance. And the maintenance includes more of a grand scale, pruning cycles for all the trees, planting relating to maintaining our population age across the forest, maintaining species diversity so we don't risk losing a massive amount of the population when something like emerald ash borer shows up, and maintaining forest health and canopy cover. But in the end, both these activities all relate to one thing. Why do we do what we do? It's often suggested that you know what you do, but you may or may not fully understand why. But if you can understand why you do what you do, you'll have an easier time selling your services or selling the importance. So why do we do what we do as arborists and urban foresters? What's the point of our occupations? What's the point of our industry? Well, I would suggest that where forests are managed to harvest wood products, we manage our urban forests for the benefits of trees to people. And so in the end, it's all about people, right? And the most important, of course, is health, specifically mental health and lowering stress, emotional health that comes from seeing greenery around us. As a result of this first one, we have lower crime rates that generally also form in areas with high canopy cover. We have other important benefits such as noise reduction, property value increasement and enhancement, a reduction of electricity bills, wildlife habitat. We can help integrate where the sides of streets are, direct where people or traffic flows through the placement of trees and vegetation. And of course, stormwater reduction. As rainwater infiltrates and hits the canopy of trees, it slows its progress through the ground, thereby reducing the amount of flow that ends up in our lakes and streams through stormwater. So huge ecological benefit from that perspective. And then also, of course, moderating the climate, which is the result of reducing temperatures. Hence, we all know that where we have lots of pavements, such as downtowns, we have very high temperatures associated with those areas. But as we move out to suburbs and even forested areas, our temperatures are reduced dramatically because trees not only uh, block sunlight from hitting the pavements, but they actually absorb that sunlight. Whereas pavement radiates all that heat right back up into the atmosphere. And aside from just absorbing the sunlight, trees also release water through the process of photosynthesizing, 
which creates kind of an air conditioning in the area, right? Because water has uh, high specific heat, it takes a lot of energy to actually increase the temperature of water. So therefore releasing water cools the surrounding environment. And they can also reduce wind speed and of course improve air quality. However, when I ask a group of high school students, what are the benefits of trees? The number one thing I get is, well, we get oxygen from them. Um, the truth of the matter is in an urban environment, because there's so much pollution, they probably provide some benefit, but most of our oxygen comes from tropical forests or even the ocean. Uh, we get some from temperate forests, but the amount that truly comes from an urban environment relative to surrounding forests is relatively small. If you look at a map that shows the canopy cover of urban environments to forest cover, it's a pretty small portion in the end. But all these other things are huge value that we gain from trees. So why, how did this all come about? Well, in this presentation, I look at predominantly three different textbooks. The first one we'll look at, which goes through a very in-depth history, is Arboriculture, History and Development in North America. Now, this book is quite detailed. It is an excellent read and a wealth of information. I just touch on a few points out of it. And then we'll compare uh, some of the practices that we've seen in the 20th century uh, by looking at a couple other textbooks that we'll get to soon. So arboriculture really developed uh, more in the, ninth, in the 20th century, but it existed and was somewhat acknowledged well before that time. As a science, it really didn't develop until uh, the 1930s or so. And prior to that, and even during that time, we were really getting lumped into horticulture, agriculture, and forestry. In fact, if I uh, look up on Wisconsin Tech College system, uh, where arboriculture fits into their hierarchy, we fall under agriculture. So if we go and meet with various folks that teach agriculture within the Wisconsin Tech College system, I'm going to be in the company of many veterinarians, many uh, folks that are teaching farming and things like that, and very few folks that teach arboriculture. With that, of course, will be horticulturalists as well, following, follow, uh, coming within that category. And if you look at the USDA, we may fall under forestry or we may fall under agriculture. And in many cases, in many collegiate programs, this arboriculture would be taught within a horticulture program. So we kind of get lumped into all these areas. Now, if we look back in time, caring for plants and trees has been around for a very long time. Early settlers prune trees and oftentimes they prune them for the idea of pilarding for firewood. So remember, we have one pruning practice referred to as pilarding. Now, pilarding is not topping. We, we have a mature tree that we come and we just make internodal cuts randomly throughout the canopy. Pilarding, of course, was where a young tree was constantly cut back annually. The result of this is you get this big knob that forms on the top and all these sprouts that come out from around this knob. And what they would do then is they would cut all those sprouts off every year. And as a result, they would have a lot of very fine firewood that they could use for heating or cooking or various activities. But truly having trees that one could enjoy was for the aristocracy and the nobles. Back in ancient Greece, there was an area that was developed called the Groves of Academy. One of the favorite trees planted in this area was actually a London plain, which was enjoyed by Plato. And so all these ancient philosophers had this garden of trees and shrubs that they go sit in and they would contemplate life and all their philosophies. And so these gardens, of course, though, were left for the uh, those studying philosophy, those that were uh, more well off. 
the peasants weren't really allowed to own land. And so they didn't really have room to plant trees or have their own area, really. And even if you go over to England today, many of these areas where there were castles are still prominent and full of uh, vegetation that was planted by the nobles back in the day. And so all these castles and gardens existed, but predominantly for nobility. <clears throat> the nobility did appreciate their gardens and their areas of tree planting and tree growth. What was interesting is what happened once they started to conquer the new worlds. With the conquering came this idea more of amenity forestry and of creating arboretums or areas of planting of appreciation of trees that grew elsewhere. And it was sort of a symbol of status that you had trees from other areas from conquerings or from uh, exhibitions. And as they started to sail and walk through the new world, they found many different trees. One of the interesting stories of this time is the story of the Wellingtonia. So Wellingtonia is a name for giant sequoia in Britain. The British actually call a giant sequoia a Wellingtonia. And in fact, they initially tried to steal the naming rights of giant sequoia back in the 1850s. And one of uh, the prominent botanists from England actually took seeds back and tried to name this tree amongst the Royal Academy prior to it being named in the Americas. And he called it a Wellingtonia gigantea. And basically in reference to the Duke of Wellington who had passed away in 1852. Now, after a lot of fighting and arguing, it was finally accepted amongst the scientific community that the tree have its traditional name, Sequoia dendron giganteum. But it took some years of debate to reclassify this. And what's interesting, if we look, and this is from an uh, art gallery in England, Compton Verney Art Gallery, here you see some Wellingtonia trees planted. And of course, we would call them giant sequoias. When I lived in New Zealand for a while, um, there was actually many giant sequoias and redwoods planted over there as well. And they would have been planted in the early 1900s or 1800s. There was one that I climbed there that was 180 feet tall and about four or five foot diameter. These trees over in New Zealand are actually growing faster in some cases than they are in their native lands in California. And so it's amazing what happens as we started to bring these species to other locations. So the science of arboriculture again really didn't develop until the 1930s. And initially it focused predominantly on girling roots a little bit, and we'll talk about that, but then also on pruning Building cavities was a huge component of early arboriculture. And then also fertilizing and spraying. Excuse me. Now, in this presentation, we won't get into uh, spraying much, but we'll talk about these other categories. So one of the first books, one of the two that I'd like to look at it's one that I have in my possession that I was able to borrow from Mark Freeberg, the city forester of Green Bay. And so this was one that he had around for a while. He's not old enough to have purchased this book when it initially came out. But The Care of Ornamental Trees by Greaves Carpenter was originally printed in 1928. And so this book from 1928 tells us all the recommendations that they had at that time. Tree Maintenance is a book that has numerous editions. I think it's on the ninth edition now. Uh, I'm going to look at the fifth edition by Peroni, which was put out in 1978. And so we can compare what were the suggestions of 1928 and then 50 years later in 1978. 
Did we improve? Did we get worse? And then how does that compare to what we suggest today in our current scientific literature? It's really interesting to look back through history and time to see how we have suggested we do our work. <clears throat> What's really interesting between these two texts also is how they refer to professionals. So in the care of ornamental trees in 1920s, they were calling us tree surgeons or the educated, college educated man or terms like that. Whereas in tree maintenance, it's workers or tree workers. So it's interesting to see that in neither of these cases, arborist has not yet come into time. It has not become a term readily used. So that's one that we started to use later on. So first let's look at stem girdling roots and the beliefs and perceptions of stem girdling roots at this time. So this is interesting. This is a photo that I took at a workshop in Rochester, Minnesota that Gary Johnson was presenting on stem girdling roots. And here you can see is a linden that was planted deep, grew for many years. It was about 18 inch diameter and just how girdled this tree was. Girdling roots, of course, can be a dramatic issue for numerous plants. If you ever see a tree that looks like a telephone pole going into the ground, Quite honestly, I suggest before you talk about pruning that tree to the client, you should talk about possibly remediating or looking for stem girdling roots first. Now, if we look at the 20s, they actually acknowledged and were well aware of stem girdling roots. Now, here they just refer to it as girdling roots. And this looks like a picture of girdling roots on a Norway maple. Now, What's interesting is why they thought this happened. So one of the suggestions was that when you planted a tree, it should be set an inch deeper than in the nursery. I don't know how they came across that, but, or how they came to decide on that. But what they believed happened to form stem girdling roots is that some trees just naturally did it. They just happened to girdle themselves and commit suicide. But the other reason that they expected it happened is that if they had soil that was broken up in a planting hole, and say the planting hole is maybe a little bit small, if you've ever planted a lot of trees, you know that some roots go out further than others, especially if it's a bare root tree. So if you take a bare root tree, and if you would put it in the hole and then twist it, if some of the roots were extending kind of up along the sides of the hole, they may start to curve during the twisting motion. And so what they were suggesting is that as people would try and twist a tree to kind of form the correct side or the side that they wanted maybe facing a home, they were causing roots to go into a circling pattern, which then eventually would girdle the tree. Now, in order to have girdling roots, you need to have one thing always happening, right? Do you think of what that is? What must we have? to have a tree that has girdling roots. Well, aside from roots that are circling or crossing the stem, we have to have a stem that's planted deep, right? We don't really have to worry generally about roots girdling other roots because roots will graft with other roots, especially in the same species. However, we do have to worry about roots crossing trunk tissue, because trunk tissue and root tissue do not readily graft together. So the result is you have compression of the stem, decay that can follow, and generally, eventually, death of the girdling is significant enough. So it's interesting enough, here they said plants it slightly deep, and the roots must be coming from twisting these trees when we plant them in the ground. Well, in the 70s, the view was also that we had stem girdling roots. And in both cases, the 70s and the 20s, they did recommend, of course, that you actually remove them using a hammer and chisel, just like we do today. However, if you were doing this in the 70s, you better make sure you plant that injury, or I mean, paint that injury. You have to paint wounds in the 70s if you're an arborist or if you're doing tree care. If you don't paint the wounds, you're going to have significant decay. 
Of course, today we know that's not the case, but it was the belief of the profession at the time. So in the 70s, Peroni suggested that girdling roots were actually formed on trees and boulevards predominantly. So in a boulevard, you have that planting space that occurs between the sidewalk and the street. Now, as these roots were in there, if they go towards the street, they would then, in their view, be deflected by the road and then pushed back towards the tree. As they came back, well, roots will grow anywhere, so they'd grow and happen to cross the trunk and then girdle the tree. And so all these roots were likely formed from that, and then also maybe in a soil where possibly good soil was surrounding the tree that was planted, but then the surrounding soil was crap, and so then that might also send the roots right back towards the trunk, and so it gets girdled in the end. Well, this first one that he suspected by the deflection of streets was not confirmed by later studies, actually. Uh, and in the 90s, of course, we attributed the formation to deep planting. Again, regardless of deflection of roots or not, the only way to have a, girdle, a tree with girdling roots is it's got to be planted deep. So that is the one consistent issue that we know does exist. These other anecdotal suspicions may or may not be true. But in the end, the tree has to not be planted deep to avoid girdling roots. So in the 70s, what's interesting is Peroni did note that container growing trees were more likely to form girdling roots. So there was some connection being placed now between the nursery practices and the formation of curdling roots in the uh, landscape. So it was especially noted that trees that were left too long developed roots that spiraled on the container walls. And of course, if these were left, then you could have curdling roots formed. Once again, the trunk still had to be planted deep, but we're still doing that today. I can't imagine they figured that out in the 70s, right? Excuse me, 50 years later, we're still planting trees deep. So they did at least have this argument correct. They did acknowledge this, which was fantastic. So they recognized part of the problem. They just didn't put together the whole picture. What was also interesting is it was noted that girdling roots are more numerous on soft wooded trees than hard wooded trees. Now, generally speaking from forestry terms, softwoods are conifers, hardwoods are deciduous trees. I don't think that's what he's referring to here. I think Peroni is referring, of course, to trees that are maybe way less, are not as hard to cut through, versus trees that are hardwooded, such as sugar maple, that is very hard to cut through. Whereas a soft maple, such as a silver or red maple, would be easier to cut through, right? And so that's maybe a more soft-wooded tree where sugar maple is a hard-wooded tree. This is an anecdotal observation. To my knowledge, there has not been any studies to confirm or deny this observation. Maybe there's something to it. If you're looking for something to study, this could be an idea if anybody's looking to go to grad school. And again, removing with a hammer and chisel and paint the wound, and today we do not paint the wounds. So next, let's move on to looking at tree pruning. It's a picture I love. This was an incredibly thick little leaf linden I pruned in Christchurch, New Zealand. You look at the left to the right, we thinned it out and did some reduction cuts in a few places to maintain the form, but also somewhat maintain a central leader. So pruning in the 1920s, how did they do it? Well, we're well aware that flush cuts occurred in the past, right? Believe it or not, maybe they didn't happen in the 1920s. So they recognized, one, that cavities occur in trees, and they recognized, they suggested that it was due to neglect, and oftentimes by incorrect pruning. Pruning done by cheap, inefficient, unskilled labor. 
And so if you had just random people or homeowners pruning their trees and somebody that was just merely capable of handling a saw, you're likely going to get cavities in your trees. Man, that's fantastic, isn't it? They were aware in the 20s that cavity formation was due to improper uh, practices. They also recognize, which I really like, and this is something that in some places we still fight today. You shouldn't use spurs or climbing spikes to assist in pruning because you're injuring the tree. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, a brain surgeon, or someone with a PhD to recognize that when you stick a spike into a tree, you're probably causing an injury. But yet, we still find unskilled laborers today who require spikes to prune a tree when climbing. Again, something that we most definitely should not do and something that can cause significant harm, decay, and oftentimes disease to infest a tree. So it's really neat that this was recognized and pointed out right in the 20s already. And then this is very fascinating to me. Now, if I look at the picture on this right, to me, B, which they're calling a correct cut, kind of looks like a flush cut, doesn't it? A is the wrong way, you're leaving stubs. B is the right way, but it kind of looks flush to me. However, we take a look at what Greaves Carpenter wrote in the text. Pruning cuts should not be made even with the trunk of the tree, which would be a flush cut, correct? As, long, as the long cut then necessarily frequently decays before it properly heals. Now again, throughout this time and even today, we hear the term heal. Shigo strongly advocated and proved that trees do not heal, which is the regeneration of tissue in the same location, right? Humans heal, animals heal, trees do not heal. They're generating organisms, not regenerating organisms. And so they will continue to generate tissue and surround injuries, but they do not heal the injuries. But this is a common misconception that persists, again, even to today. So notice this next term. The cut should be made at the collar, which does not leave a stub, but will facilitate healing of the cut. At the collar. The term Scheigel used. In the 20s? Well, what happened later on? How did we end up having flush cuts? They knew in the 20s you don't do that. So let's move on to the 70s. So this is excellent. In the 70s, if you're going to prune, these are the equipment that you need. Here's some cable. Here's a cart that looks from the 1850s. You see all the cabling gear and the hand drill in here. Thank God I'm not having to use that anymore. And then... This is the saw that you're going to climb with. Large cross cut here, and this would be your hand saw up in the tree. Anybody want to go back and prune in the 70s? Oh, thankful, so thankful for my silky or samurai or fano, whichever one is your choice. Any of those are so many leagues beyond what is used here that I'm so thankful for it. So again, it was recommended that you have a hand saw with at least six teeth to an inch. Good luck on finding anything with a tri-cut blade, of course. You're just having regular hand saw teeth here. A cross-cut saw that's at least three feet long for the large cuts. And also a power chainsaw of several sizes. Now, of course, a power chainsaw at that time is not your T540 or 201. This was a massive heavy anchor that you would haul into the tree and manage to hold to make a cut. So not anything like what we have today. And they were also using manila rope, of course. So manila rope, 150 foot of half inch diameter. Now 150 foot of half inch diameter manila rope has a breaking strength of right about 1,980 pounds. Our current standard is a minimum breaking strength of 5,400 pounds for a climbing line. And that's in a half inch diameter or 11 mil. 
Now, at 1980 pounds, if you're going to maintain the 10%, which our rule of 5,400 is usually even less than 10% cycle uh, of tensile strength for max loading, uh, at 10% of max load, to maintain a high number of cycles to failure in your climbing line on this manila rope, you better not weigh any more than 198 pounds with your equipment. So any of you out there who weigh more than 198 pounds with your equipment on would have been wearing out your ropes much more quickly. Not to mention natural fiber ropes just wear much faster than traditional ropes and you have a dramatic loss of strength in the initial uses. If you were rigging, you'd use a three quarter inch rope that had a breaking strength of 4,030 pounds. So again, those heavy oak logs, you might not get too many drops out of those ones. So it's just interesting to look at what they used. So the cuts in the 70s need to be flush to the tree. Let me take a look here. Here's flush to the tree. If you couldn't get flush to the tree, then you actually had to trace around the injury. Now, why would they say cut away the bark and trace the wound? Oh my gosh, what were they doing to these trees? Well, take a look at the pattern on this flushed limb. Notice the dieback. My guess is this is what they observed. They observed this dieback so if you traced it, you might get more rapid appearance of callus growth and sealing, right? And so therefore, trace the injury so that way you already start the process of what's going to happen anyways. And if you can make a little bit better angles or cuts, then, well, it's only going to be better for the tree. What's interesting is they did still employ a three cut method. Here you can see three cuts and flush her right to the trunk. The author did know too that we don't want to tear any injuries. So as you're cutting, rig this stub off or make sure you can hold it so that way we don't tear because we need to have a nice flush cut. But if we tear, it's going to injure the tree dramatically. So we don't want to do that. A trained arbor or trained tree worker will not tear into the tree. So that's something I fully agree with. We don't want to tear trees. Unfortunately, again, though, we're on this idea of flush cuts. We went from collar cuts to flush cuts until Shigo came along. And here's just an example, again, of why we want to avoid flush cuts. This is this one on the upper left. So as we flush cut, and that's cutting straight to the stem, here you can see just the decay or discolored wood that shows up. Everything discolors in this area now except for the new growth. And you have the formation of a barrier zone. And so all of this center is like to decay over time. So today, of course, we promote pruning collar cuts, just like in the 20s. So a three-cut method. Now, a slight variation there in Gilman's book, he actually suggests a cut one underneath and a cut two that's a match cut on top versus in front. Uh, either way, honestly works. If you cut underneath and you match cut on top, sometimes you can in some species, especially in spring, get the peeling of bark actually past your bypass and down the side of the tree, especially with elm in spring if you're pruning it before the, the uh, deadlines. And then the third cut, of course, outside the collar, the result is you get this beautiful donut formation and very little decay that forms in the center. What's interesting is they dealt with included bark very similarly. So here you can see a three cut method of stub and they say cut up to the inclusion. The only difference is I would suggest today we actually prune at a little bit less severe of an angle. You can see here the angle is pretty severe, which makes a greater surface area of where that injury is. Greater the surface area, the longer it takes to seal over the injury. And so here, if we have any more dieback, we could always cut that back in the future. But here we have a reduction cut. 
In this case, this one can handle it all the way up. Uh, we have one third the diameter. We're pruning trunk tissue, but again, it's the lesser of two evils and we'll have less decay. And that's of course to reduce the growth of a co-dominant leader. And here again on included bark, we look at making our cuts right there to the inclusion to allow more rapid formation of callus growth surrounding that injury without a stub that remains of where that inclusion occurs. And of course, we try and reduce these co-dominants and especially the included bark ones because we can have massive tear out. Now, the biggest concern with all this is when we have these large injuries or these co-dominant stems with large injuries, we now have a large portion of the trunk that decays out. And that's a major problem. One of the biggest ways to really prevent decay and pruning is just don't make large pruning cuts. That's our biggest concern. We'll talk about that more in a second. So here, of course, they suggested that you treat the wounds. And treatment of the wounds was by painting. So any cuts were supposed to be painted in the trees. You can find images actually of pruning in the 70s where they had a pole saw with a saw on one end and a paintbrush on the back end. So they could dip it and on the back side where they made the cut, go out and paint the wound. Oh, that would be tedious work. I'm so glad we're past that. I can't imagine having to bring paint with me for every cut I make in a tree. And I didn't prune back then. I presume they painted every cut, but maybe they only painted large ones. I'm not positive, to be honest. But you had to use shellac, uh, black top seal, uh, grafting wax, paint. Any of that was used. And it was looked at as the bark acts like the epidermis of a tree, just as there's skin on a human. Once it's broken, you can have infection. And so the suggestion was if you painted it and you inspect it regularly and recoat, you can prevent these infections. Now, is there anything to this? And I'm often asked this. Well, one of the problems is sealants wear off in natural conditions. And fungicide treatments may initially be effective, but again, if you're not gonna retreat that regularly, like every few months or something, these fungicides wear off. And they can maybe be present for up to 157 days following treatment, but are you gonna come out then and continue to treat that year after year on all the cuts you make. So if you have one large cut, maybe it's something you could try, or if you have one large injury that forms on a tree, but your best decay prevention is honestly smaller injuries. If we create small injuries, reducing the time it takes the tree to seal over the injury, then as it seals over, it creates anoxic conditions within the tree. Because remember on those injuries, those tissues related to that injury are sealed off from the rest of the tree. So once the tree seals over those injuries, oxygen no longer penetrates and aerobic organisms such as fungi then are no longer able to actively grow and break down tissues. One of the suggestions is to even avoid removal where heartwood is visible. You're more likely to not have decay occurring then. So what you don't want is this. This is a tree in my front yard, a silver maple that had a large injury to it in the past. It's kind of fun as I have a little mountain ash growing there. And one of the reasons is these co-dominant stems. So you see a co-dominant on the left or lateral branch on the right. What I did to create this in our lab, we actually draw food coloring through branch tissues and trunk tissue. And so what you see is actually the coloration of the actual tissues of the tree. And where you see red here, those are tissues where of this branch was removed, these tissues are directly connected to that limb. Recall branch and trunk tissues are not actually connected. They grow around each other. So if you cut off a limb, the tissues relating to that limb are done. They will decay, potentially or they need to be sealed off before decay occurs. So as we remove this codominant or that codominant were to fail, 
one third of this tree will decay out and possibly never even have a chance to completely seal. But on this lateral branch, it's maybe one eighth of the tree, not a big deal. So this is why we want to prevent codominance. We want to reduce the decay then that results. So when injuries occur, the suggestion in the 20s was that uh, cavities, when they occurred, if you put cement in, cement is foreign. You can never get it perfect. And so even with proper pruning, decay will set in. They suggest that unless you paint it every year or two. So they recognize that if you're going to paint, you got to paint regularly. Um, but really what they recognized is that we don't necessarily, we can put cement in, but there's no possible way for a union between cement and the wood of the tree. So initially cement was put in solid blocks. They found that it couldn't withstand it. Over time in the 70s, what they did to fix this is they scraped out any decay wood and they started layering their cement. They would layer their cement in six inch segments as they went up. Then once they put it in, they bolt it to the tree so that the two couldn't move separate. So since there was no normal union that form, they forced a union. Decay wasn't really understood well at this time. In the 20s, they recognized cement really didn't work well. In the 70s, it almost became an art form. In both cases, there was still misunderstanding that occurred because unfortunately, cement cannot sway with the tree. And so you formed a very rigid base in this case. <clears throat> Fertilization was an interesting idea. So it was recognized that different formulations would help, but in the 20s, they recognized that you really should use more organic forms because if you constantly put down inorganic forms, you actually produce salt over time in the soil. And these nutrient salts accumulate over time and can actually naturally compact the soil and make the soil poor for growing plants. What was also interesting is they suggested that you do not apply fertilizer to the top of the soil because if you apply it here, it draws up the fine roots into an area where they're more likely to dry out. Interesting observation, or they may be burned by chemicals. And so they suggest that you put the fertilizer down in an area in the soil where the roots were. And they also suggested that you put it out to the farthest extending branches. At this point, they only understood that the roots only grew out to that point. They didn't realize that roots could actually grow two to three times the height of a tree. Peroni also suggested that fertilizer should be put in the soil. So they were pretty correct in these areas. There was a lot of disagreement about nitrogen. Some noted that higher formations were formulations were more effective. Some claim that uh, nitrogen really needs to be from organic sources. Others claim that could come entirely from inorganic sources. So again, research has helped us in this area, thankfully. Uh, there was some research done by Werner and Joel in 2013 that looked at urban trees and found that young trees utilize significantly greater nitrogen than older trees. What happens here is young trees are trying to push growth. In a natural setting of a forest, these trees would be trying to grow up into the canopy to gain light. And so they utilize nitrogen rapidly whenever it's available to push elongation of their cells or height growth. Old trees, however, need to focus more on uh, defense and maintaining what they have. In a forest, these old trees would have an established canopy that gives them all the food they need. However, their greatest hindrance is decay and damage from fungi. And so older trees don't actually really need growth or nitrogen pushing their growth. And so, and that's where we've even found success with Canvastat or Shortstop, these growth regulators that slow the growth of the tree and often even appear to increase fine root growth. Older trees need different things than younger trees. 
And we have to be careful with our fertilization that we're not adding high salt contents. What's interesting is when we add some of these fertilizers, we can affect mycorrhizae establishment. Just something I wanted to touch on quick. We don't understand mycorrhizae well in our urban environment. We know it exists, but one of the things we found is if we uh, have heavily fertilized areas, we don't get the establishment of mycorrhizae. Other studies have suggested that uh, if we have a little bit older area that has not recently been disturbed, we may also be able to get mycorrhizae established. So this is some new information that we found relating to fertilization, is trying to reduce our fertilization, maybe try not to disturb the site, and try to potentially have some more inorganic sources of fertilizer. So just to kind of start to close out, urban trees always require care because we've taken them out of a forest setting and put them into an urban environment. In this environment, they're no longer in community and all sides of the tree gain light, creating co-dominant stems and oftentimes structural weaknesses. So the argument is, do urban trees ever require care? Absolutely. Uh, forest trees do not require care because they grow differently and they grow in different habitats. If you want trees that don't require care, this is maybe your best option. This is kind of interesting. This is in Pittsburgh, and I saw this during my time there for TCIA a couple of years ago. So magnolias for Pittsburgh are actually metal trees. And it's fascinating because you walk by and they look wonderfully lifelike, but Magnolias do not flower in winter. And so you, as an arborist, you look and you say, what's going on here? And you notice that they're actually metal trees, but the artist did a fantastic job. So in closing, how should we approach arboriculture? Well, there's two ways. We can approach from a horticulture, a growing perspective, or a management perspective. And the way that I teach it at the college, for example, is from a natural resources perspective, but also acknowledging the horticultural side of things. So we need to be able to manage the trees, whether it's an individual tree and we're managing the canopy and the growing conditions. But we also need to understand the proper conditions for successful growth of trees. A way to meld these philosophies, I think, is to pay attention to forests, which is more of the natural resources side of it. Understanding how do we manage trees in forests? How do we, where do trees grow? Where do they fit within succession within forests or the orderly change of landscapes from fields to forests? So as landscapes change from a field, certain species will move in and pioneer these sites. These species moving in and pioneering these sites are well adapted to disturbance. These are often ones that we find being the best urban trees. Trees that grow in later succession climax forests or old growth forests are ones that do not handle disturbance well. A great example of this is sugar maple. How does sugar maple do in a heavily urbanized area? Well, if you ever find it, they often do very poor. Or if you have an established site, it could do very well. In our forests, especially in northern Wisconsin, it's the predominant species growing because it handles shade very well and it outcompetes other trees well. However, trees such as river birch or silver maple that grow in river bottoms are very accustomed to disturbance. Baroque as well. And so these trees seem to do very well in an urban environment. So knowing the history of trees and of various species can really help you understand right site, right location. You look at this forest of sugar maple, that's the soil we would expect to see in that environment. Some duff or litter, followed by some organic area very low bulk density, not compacted. That's where these trees thrive. What does your area look like?
And so understanding where these trees grow and where they survive plays a crucial role in establishing them successfully. And last but not least is understanding how to be a profession. They even dealt with this back in the 20s. And I'll give you a chance to read this very briefly, but also I'd be happy to share this PowerPoint with anyone. Uh, and I have my email at the end. And last but not least, Alex Shigo said, don't tell me what you are going to do, tell me what you have done. And one of my suggestions to everyone is become involved in your organization, become involved in Illinois Arbor Association. You start getting involved, you start meeting many people, you start growing yourself in this profession much more quickly than if you remain on your own. And so be involved, be part of the organization, grow well, grow strong and prosper.